All right, we've been uh, chugging through Romans now, and uh, we've made it all the way to 3, uh, 21 through 31. We're actually today uh, focusing in on chapter, or excuse me, verses 27 through 31, but we're going to give a recap because it's important for us to, if we've forgotten, to get our context back, okay? Uh, because uh, in 27 through th- 31, he's really... Um, asking some questions about what we covered last week. Uh, But before we get going again, let's uh, open in a word of prayer. And Father, we do, um, we do thank you, God, for, um, for the gospel. And uh, what is that? It is, it is that you, um, you made the way possible uh, through your son, Lord. It was in your eternal plan uh, you, you knew uh, from the beginning that man would uh, uh, choose a sin and, that's, and that through that sin, death would enter and, uh, Lord, that there would be a separation. And even all the way back then, you provided uh, a sacrifice as you covered Adam and Eve, Lord, um, where they tried to sow fig leaves, Lord, for themselves and cover their sin in their own self-righteousness, Lord. You said, no, it's this innocent uh, blood has to be shed and I have to cover you uh, Lord and and so in the in a like manner Lord you sent your son Jesus Christ the God man uh, to die and pay the penalty of our sin on the cross uh, and it is your blood that provided a re- redemption and, and, and propitiation as we look at these terms again today it's by the blood uh, of your son that our sins are remiss, uh, Lord, and, uh, and the only condition that your word says and provides is that we believe this gospel message uh, just as the jailers uh, uh, or, or the jailer cried out to, to Paul and Silas, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they responded, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And that's it in its simplicity, Lord. But you didn't just die, you rose again in your body so that we uh, might live with you eternally. And uh, Lord, and there is a promise and a hope of, uh, our, of spending eternity with you in a new body, Lord, an eternal body uh, that will not, um, in heaven, will not suffer um, decay, uh, Lord. But uh, again, we will be restored uh, completely in fellowship, and we will be freed not only from sin's penalty and the effects of sin, but the very presence of sin will no longer be there, and uh, no more sickness, no more death. And so, Father, we we thank you for these things that you have accomplished. We look to you and, and praise you and bring glory and honor to you for your good works, God. Uh, for the righteousness of of man is as a filthy rag, is what your word says, and we dare not and we cannot uh, uh, make ourselves right before you in our own works and deeds, Lord, Uh, but simply by receiving this gift, because the gospel is a gift, for God so loved the world that he gave, and he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whosoever believes in him shall not die but have everlasting life at the moment of believing and so father we thank you for your glorious work of salvation in jesus name amen and so paul we continue here uh in the book of romans and we'll pick up in uh, uh verse uh 21 get this thing going again there we go and paul says and remember the backdrop okay paul has just brought all all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one single person, right? As we just, nobody can produce the righteousness of God. Nobody can make themselves right before their God on their own, whether through commitment or, or trying to do good works or anything. And then Paul says, but now, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, and this is the principle of the law, is revealed being witnessed by the Mosaic law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God. How? Through faith in Jesus Christ, to whom? All and on all who what? Believe. For 
There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where's boasting then? It's excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify, that one God will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. And so, Again, last week, uh, just we'll take a quick look at our visual outline just to see the forest, where we're at, where we're going, where we've come from. Okay, so we just finished um, the doctrine of sin. Remember, Amar theology, the doctrine of sin. And, uh, and 320, he makes the transition. We made that transition now in 321, and we're talking about really justification, uh, and we use the term salvation, and this is an, an important point uh, to make that I need to make, is, is that the book of Romans, its intended purpose, remember when we go back, who is the audience? Who's the audience? Anybody want? What was that? What? Sorry. Believers. They've already believed because he's writing, I've heard of your faith. All the way where he's at, I've, I've heard of your faith already. So, Paul's not writing to save anybody. Even though we're looking at this and we're, we're, we're building this doctrine, Paul's just writing, again, he, does not, he has not yet been to Rome. He does not know these people that are, are already laboring. So he's, he's writing this whole doctrinal, you know, pretty much this whole doctrinal statement to establish them, you know, so that before he gets there, he's, this groundwork's already laid. You know, it's not like Cor Corinth where Paul, you know, he, had, he knew them because he had been there and they were a product of his ministry uh, as an apostle and, and as a missionary. But, uh, you know, because he's writing them to correct them, right? In 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, all the issues that are going on there. And then, uh, you know, and so, you know, Romans, again, it's, it's to those that are already safe. So when we read these terms, there is not a single you know, term as far as uh, a soteriological term uh, uh, in the sozo group, like as, as far as, uh, you know, Paul doesn't give the gospel message. He doesn't preach Christ and him crucified in here because it's, it's not the issue. He's just establishing them in their faith, right? So he's, he's saying, look, this is, you know, here's, here's what happened to you, basically. You know, here's what God has done. And here are the riches and, and, and the things of, you know, how you live now is by faith. Remember, because in, in 17, he ends there and he says, you know, because he says, uh, in 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. For as it is written, the just shall live by what? Faith. So that's, that's how we then live, and that's what Paul is saying, you know, and that's, that's the whole book of Romans. He's encouraging these fellow believers. So, so as you can see then, here's our doctrine, right? We start off with the doctrine of sin, salvation, sanctification, glorification, and then we look at God's sovereignty and how it pertains to Israel and their past election, Israel and their present rejection of their Messiah, and Israel's future salvation, and this is really important to look at. A lot of people will pull from this a doctrine, a gospel doctrine, and that is not what it's for. And, but we'll put that in context when we get to it. But here, verses you know, 1 through 8 through 39, we're looking at the revelation of the righteousness of God. And today, um, you know, and where we started last week, uh, we, um, we're going to be focusing on the effects of salvation, again, all the way through chapter uh, nine. 
So uh, we're going to look at the effects of uh, salvation. So last week we began to study about the glorious works of God as we learned some biblical facts concerning then soteriology, and this is what we're studying on Tuesday nights, and it is, that's simply the doctrine of salvation, okay? And specifically, as it pertains then to justification and the imputation of God's righteousness. We'll look at those, I'll go over these words again. So, but in verses 21 through 26, Paul gave us a description of justification, and we define justification, and it is a legal term, Again, in the court of law, to be justified. Think of that mentality. It's a legal term that means to be acquitted, to be free of charges, and be pronounced and treated as righteous. So justification, again, what did he say back here? He says, being justified, how? Freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood, that's how he paid for it, through faith. Again, you know, this is a gift that we, we simply receive by faith. Um, and so thus, part of what we've discovered in our study of the book of Romans so far is that when it comes to both condemnation, all the way through 320, and justification, There is no distinction between barbarian, Gentile, or Jew, between the immoral sinner, the moral sinner, or the religious sinner. All are condemned before a thrice holy God. And furthermore, apart from the imputed righteousness of Christ, all remain guilty and deserving of death. Therefore, all of humanity needs the imputed righteousness of God for individual salvation again imputation imputation is christ's is when christ's righteousness is transferred to us at the point of faith that's how we receive the the righteousness and again it's his righteousness it's not ours and it's not that we automatically now oh well we're righteous and i'm operating in righteousness no it still belongs to him it's imputed to us and we'll talk about impartation later, but, but it's been in, in, imputed to us. And in the court of, courtroom of heaven, we have been declared righteous simply because of that imputed righteousness. Because we have been clothed and we have been covered. We've been imputed that righteousness of, of Christ. But we don't become that righteous. That's an important distinction to make. Um, and, and, and again, so we also learned of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption is the payment of a purchase in order to release from bondage. And what were we in bondage to? Sin. We were slaves. We had no choice. We were slaves to sin. And the blood of Christ, again, through, uh, through his redemption, set us free, has released us from the bondage of friend. Uh, of sin, and that's why Paul in the book of Ro- Roman, or excuse me, Paul in the book of uh, Galatians says it's for freedom that you've been set free. Again, to serve the Lord, so we don't have to worry about those things. Oh, I'm, you know, is God going to whack me over the head because I messed up? No. Like again, we have been freed from sin, uh, uh, practically, positionally, uh, uh, or, or excuse me, positionally and practically, we can be saved from the uh, power of sin, as we'll see today uh, but so so then the fact that you are in Christ Jesus means that he has purchased you from bondage you are no longer a slave to sin and this is a positional truth that will never change for the one who has trusted the gospel of Christ for their individual salvation we are in fact eternally in Christ Jesus, having been identified with him in his, his death, burial, and resurrection. The action of redemption by Christ has been, for, been performed, and the believer's freedom from the penalty and bondage of sin is a statement of fact, period. This is, this is in the Greek, in the indicative mood, the verb in Christ Jesus. It expresses an action being performed as a statement of fact. 
It is biblical truth. Your identity is no longer in Adam, but rather in Christ Jesus. You, you, you have been set free from the bondage of sin, and again, that righteousness has been imputed to you, and you are now in Christ Jesus, and that does not change. So the, then, uh, uh, sorry, the action of redemption, um, so how did he do this then is the question. How did he do this? Well, Jesus Christ, we read, was set forth, or the way that translates in the Greek is displayed publicly. publicly. So Jesus Christ was displayed publicly by God as a propitiation by his blood. And propitiation is the satisfaction of divine wrath. Jesus Christ's blood satisfied the divine wrath of the Father. Praise the Lord. That, brothers and sisters, is good news. That is good news. And as we read the first six verses, uh, as we read the first six verses, rather, we saw how Paul emphasized several truths about the righteousness of God. I'm going to read through these real quick. But the righteousness of God is, in fact, from God. And I know that seems fundamental and, oh, well, it says it right there, it's of God. But, but it is such an important thing to understand because this righteousness is not something that we recreate or that comes from us. Again, it is the imputed righteousness of God. The very righteousness of Christ is put into your account. You are, in fact, of now um, you are in Christ Jesus, and it's, it's revealed. The righteousness of God is revealed. It's revealed apart from the law, and it's witnessed by the Old Testament. Uh, that was an important fact because this imputation by faith in, in Jesus Christ is not new to the New Testament. Remember, Abram, before there ever was a nation of Israel, believed God, and it was what? Credited to him as righteousness. You're saved. It has always been, you have the from Old Testament to New Testament, as far as how we respond is our condition in trusting God has always been the same. And we'll, we'll look at that a little bit later, but also it's available to all and it's imputed to all who simply believe and it's needed by all. And it's given again freely by his grace and it's through the redemptive payment of Jesus Christ. The righteousness of God is displayed, as we saw publicly, as due to the propitiatory satisfaction of Christ's blood. That's a mouthful. And the righteousness of God is a demonstration of God as both just and the justifier. If you remember the story last week about the judge who, who charged the lady and she had the speeding fine and and uh, she had to pay a hundred bucks, and she was pleading, "I don't have a hundred bucks." And he said, "I cannot change the law. That's what you owe." And uh, he said, "You know, uh, if you don't have it, you know, from his judicial seat, you'll have to go to jail." And so, you know, after the lady, you know, she pleaded, and she he said, I, "I cannot change it." And so, you know, that's that's the verdict. And the judge takes off his robe and sets it sets it down. And he walks down and he takes out his wallet and he sits, pulls out a hundred bucks and says, here's the payment for your fine. Are you willing to accept it? That's the kicker. Is your pride so big that you cannot trust the authoritative word of God and what the gospel message is? That's the kicker. You know, can you receive it? Can you just simply say, again, you don't have to, but, but that woman walked away grateful you know, she walked away just in glory because of, of uh, her, 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 her debt had been paid. And yours and mine, greater than that, our sin debt, which was an eternal debt, has been paid in full by the blood of Christ Jesus. Do you see what riches we have? And so today, as we direct our attention to verses 27 through 31, we're going to look at or, or to hear the word of God's defense of justification by faith alone, as Paul concludes that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. And he then claims, however, that the law of faith does not render the Mosaic law useless, but rather the principle or intended purpose of the law is established or confirmed by the law of faith. So we'll see what that means. All right, so... 
Again, where is boasting then? It is excluded. You see, if we by faith, if we by faith are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, and he is both just, like that judge, and the justifier who paid the debt of the one who has faith in Jesus, no man can boast. No man can boast. It is excluded from the doctrine of salvation. Well, by what law or by what principle is boasting excluded then? Is boasting excluded by the law of works? No. Let me phrase it another way. If justification is by works, if justification were by works, boasting is not excluded. In other words, if I could justify myself by my works, then I've got something to boast about. Because what happens when I add commitment or any sort of con- anything on my part as a condition to receive the gospel message of Christ? What? It becomes something that I can boast about, right? And I borrowed this slide. This is, uh, was, uh, I was given permission by uh, my professor, Dennis Roxers, uh, so uh, if you see any of his his videos, this will look familiar to you. Uh, But um, if I add any amount of work or commitment uh, to the complete and finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, I have added a meritorious condition to the gospel of Christ. And the gospel is no longer a free gift, It's become something I've earned by some level of commitment, and I can now boast in whatever percentage of commitment I've made. In this slide, you know, it's 10%. You know, because religion says, well, Jesus Christ did 90, but his his blood wasn't sufficient. You gotta do your 10%, right? And this is salvation by works. What the Bible says and what God says is Jesus paid it all. It is finished. It is complete. It is a done deal. And we simply trust in the efficacy and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ's blood on the cross. And this is salvation by God's grace. So, again, when I add to it, it's no longer a free gift, but I'm trying to barter. I'm trying to, I'm trying to say, you know, again, well, you know, and this is pride, like this is, again, you know, if we turn the gospel of Christ into a religious-based system, we have nullified the propitiatory power of the blood of Christ. Christ has become, as Paul says, of no effect unto you. And as the, as the CJB says, um, and that's, this is just the complete Jewish Bible version. I, this brings greater clarity. It says, you who are trying to be, be declared righteous by God through legalism have severed yourselves from the Messiah. You have fallen away from God's grace. When we try and add works to the gospel, that's what we do. Again, If you are trying to be justified by legalism, it is not grace. And if you are justified, in fact, by grace, it is not legalism. And Paul explains to us in chapter 6, verses 12 through 15 of the book of Galatians, why some people do this. Now, I didn't put, actually, I did put this one on there, but uh, we'll get to a longer section in a minute of Galatians where I'm just going to have to ask you guys to turn there and read along, but I got this one up there. Uh, So chapter 6, verses 12 through 15 in the book of Galatians, um, and remember who Paul's writing to in in Galatia, and um, you know, the the condition there, and we'll talk about that later, but he, he says, you know, again, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, again, before man, not before God, but in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised. Why? Only that they may not suffer persecution of the cross of Christ. It's to save their own skin. It's so that they don't face persecution. 
For not even those who are circumcised keep the law. Again, the Jews didn't even keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. <laughs> Look, here's another one that we've added to our account. You know, here's another notch under our belt. You know, one for legalism, in other words. But God forbid, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ, here it is, in Christ Jesus, positional truth, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And that's Paul's conclusion there in, in Galatians 6, 12 through 15. And so that's why some do. This legalistic mentality is at the heart of the false gospel message that is being preached today by and large in Christendom. Many today turn the law of faith into a conditioned response. Namely, according to Paul, as we just read, that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ, right? Ecumenicalism, Unitarianism, their safety in numbers, and let's not offend anyone with the gospel of Christ. You know, let's blend in to every other religion so as to not rock the proverbial boat and face persecution. Let's just all get along, right? And you have to pay close attention to semantics when you listen to people present the word of God. Many pastor teachers, authors, theologians, philosophers, you know, all these people with important papers will impregnate a term as simple as faith with their fleshly philosophy. So instead of simply believing or accepting the free gift of salvation as explained some 200 times in the Bible, you must also acknowledge, confess, commit, admit, invite, etc. You must work for it in some way. This is the pride of life. And it is so alluring to our sin nature, right? Go out to dinner with me and allow me to pay for your dinner and pick up your tab. Ooh. You know, like, how dare you, right? You know, how dare you? But this is, in fact, you know, again, Jesus paid it all. And let me say this before I go. I have no, I have no personal vendetta against people that teach this. And I use this individual like, like Paul, because Paul called these people out by name. And he also said, you know, uh, he, he brought them under the very anathema, which is a curse of God. You know, may the wrath of God be upon that individual's ministry because they're preaching a false gospel. And I have no personal vendetta. And I think, you know, this person is my brother. But when it comes to, when it comes to the household of God and what my role is as a pastor and as a gatekeeper, I have to warn you and I have to bring these to your attention so that you see what you are hearing. Because, you know, again, this, is, this message determines whether a person goes to heaven or hell. That's its importance. So if I tell you directions somewhere and I tell you to take a right instead of taking a left and you end up in Iowa instead of Streeter, you know, I mean, you, you know, I, I've done a bad thing. But this is, this is heaven and hell, folks. This is your eternal salvation. And so this is not against this individual. I'm not speaking out against this individual, but I do have an issue with the individual's doctrine, okay? Let's make that clear. Not him, but the doctrine. And I think this, this individual I truly believe is saved, and I believe that he was saved through the gospel that we've already presented. But, you know, again, like so many other, they, he cuddled up with some friends, that were of a Calvinistic persuasion. He started reading the Puritan writings and the reformers, and then he started going in this direction. And it became more and more alluring, and so now you know, he teaches a gospel of works. And so this is exactly what, we read this quote last week, and it's a beautiful quote. Justification may be defined as an act of God whereby he imputes to a believing sinner the full and perfect righteousness of Christ, forgiving the sinner of all unrighteousness, declaring him or her perfectly righteous in God's sight, thus delivering the believer from all condemnation, 
That definition contains several elements, imputed righteousness, forgiveness of sins, a new standing before God, and a reversal of God's wrath. Those all indicate that justification is a legal verdict. It is a forensic reality that takes place in the court of God, not in the heart of the sinner. So, John MacArthur, in his book, The Gospel According to Jesus, gives this quote, but if MacArthur spoke the same biblical language as you and I do, this would be a wonderful quote. However, when he uses the term believer, he means those whom God has chosen to believe, those who cannot resist the grace of God and have no choice but to believe. You see, where John MacArthur gets it wrong is between biblical fact and his Calvinist philosophy. The gospel, according to John MacArthur, is of a God who picks and chooses through election those who believe and condemn those who cannot, who cannot choose to believe. That's all packed in that word believer. It is not just believing. And again, he'll say it's not simple believism or not simply believing or not, you know, again, you have to pay close attention because I could have used this quote. You would have never known the difference because it was out of context. But now that you know the author and now that you know the background, that's why I did it intentionally. So answer this question for me. If salvation is based on God randomly saving people, again, granting them, uh, is, is God demonstrating righteousness in this? Can we declare that God has become both the uh, just and the justifier in this philosophy? What's the purpose of faith? According to MacArthur's Calvinistic philosophy, philosophy faith is a gift, and it is only granted to those whom God chooses to give it to. I'll give you faith, I'll give you faith, I'll give you faith. So, that's bad news. That is bad news. And what would be the point of suffering for the sake of the gospel of Christ? Why even share the gospel at all if God makes some believe? But what does the Bible say? That's what I'm interested in. And we will see Paul explain further next week in Romans 4 or 5. It says, but to him who does not work but believes, and this is simple believe, on him who justifies the ungodly, his what? His is accounted for righteousness. Not his commitment, not his work, not declaring that Jesus is Lord. Jesus was Lord long before I understood that he was Lord, okay? He's always been Lord. You know, that's the reality. I don't make him Lord. God declared him Lord. God the Father said, Jesus, you know, he declared Jesus as Lord. So, and, he, and then he, uh, it says, uh, excuse me, let me back up. And even Jesus then explained to Martha in John eleven twenty five 25 through 26. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die physically, he shall live, and whoever lives physically and believes in me shall never die. That's everlasting life. That's eternally. Do you believe this? And that's what he asked Martha. Do you believe this? So, again, if Jesus made people believe... Do you think he would have asked the question, do you believe this? <laughs> nor would God have demonstrated his righteousness, nor would God have demonstrated his righteousness through many infallible proofs. As John explains later in his gospel, he says, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, 
These signs, these miraculous signs are recorded that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Who's the onus on? Who's the onus on? This is the word of God. It has been written in, in specifically in John. All these miracles were recorded that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. You have a choice. Again, you know, and, and furthermore, yours and mine election is in Christ Jesus, for he is the elect one. Do you see that? He is the elect God man. It has always been Christ Jesus through, through whom uh, salvation would come. Salvation is in no other. It is found solely in the God man, Christ Jesus. Fully God, fully man. And that's how it had to be in order for that sin debt to be paid for because it was due to us. It was due to mankind. We owed that debt. And so, again, he who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That is crystal clear. And the onus is on the individual to trust the gospel of Christ for salvation, to trust the name of the only begotten Son of God. So, But boasting is excluded by the law or principle of faith, but by the law of faith. So boasting then is excluded by the law of faith. Works and faith are two different principles. Works requires some sort of effort on your behalf. Works requires you to do something. See, the law was never intended to be a means of justification. The Mosaic law has never and can never save anyone from the penalty of sin. The principle of the law is of works, or as Paul phrases it, the works of the law, right? Either you shall or you shall not, right? That's what the law says, you know, it points to your works, you shall or you shall not. And back in uh, chapter three, verse 21, Remember, Paul claimed that the Mosaic law and the prophets, prophets witnessed the righteousness of God. So if it was how righteousness came, how could it, you know, again, bear witness to the righteousness of God? In other words, the witness of the law and prophets points, points to God's righteousness. They say, don't look at us for justification. We're going to condemn you. We're going to show you where you fail. Look to the righteousness of God displayed publicly on the cross by his son, Jesus Christ. That's what their intended purpose is to point to Christ Jesus. You know, they, they point to his righteousness. Faith, on the other hand, is absent of any effort from you. It does, faith does, however, involve a choice, as we just said, and an object of choice. You know, and that's, that's, that's where a lot of people get the gospel wrong. They'll give the presentation of Christ and him crucified, but again, okay, what do I do? How do I respond to that? Just like, this, just like the jailer, what must I do? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What do I do? You know, again, and in his mind was a very religious response. What do I do? And what was their response? Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you, you shall be saved. It's something that's given to you at the moment of believing. You see, when an individual hears the gospel of Christ as presented in the word of God, he has a choice to believe it or not. And so what is then the object of faith? And as, as I already stated, namely the object of your faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, you know, where the law again, points to, faith simply says, you know, trust, trust me, trust my completed and finished work, trust me for your salvation, 
you know, receive the free grace gift of salvation by faith. This is the law of faith, and there is no faith in the law, the prophets, or even the works of man. There shouldn't be, and in fact, there is none, but our faith is in the cross work of Jesus Christ. You see, our faith is in the fact that he has justified us freely by his grace. He has redeemed us by his precious blood. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. In other words, we conclude that a man is declared righteous in the court of heaven by God, how? By faith in in who? In his son, apart from or independent of the works of the law. You see, the law of faith excludes boasting and works because you have absolutely nothing to boast about, except like Paul said, may I boast in nothing except the cross of Christ. That's what we boast in. All glory and honor for your individual salvation goes to God. Or else we find ourselves suppressing the truth in unrighteous deeds and denying God glory. That's what happens when a false gospel is preached. And that is, again, that's what the false gospel does. It denies, it suppresses the truth in unrighteousness and it denies God glory. It turns the spotlight where? From God to me. You see, if I had something, then the spotlight's no longer on the cross of Christ, but it's on me. It's that simple, folks. For we cannot save ourselves, which is why we need a Savior. Even after we are justified, we need daily salvation from the ongoing effects of sin, sometimes moment by moment. I'll confess to you in my life, sometimes it's moment by moment, you know. We need to be sanctified by the Word of God and by the power of His Holy Spirit. And as we yield ourselves to the Spirit, instead of presenting our members to the sin nature, we then can give glory to God and exclaim that I not only am I saved, but I am being saved. Then, as we look forward and hope to the promise of the rapture of the church, of the bride of Christ, we can glorify God further by exclaiming, I will be saved. And we will be saved from the very presence then of sin. You see, this, I went through probably 30 plus years of my Christian life and never saw this. No one ever explained this to me. And once I did, or once they did, once a gifted pastor teacher explained this to me, whoa, I was knocked off my rocker. I mean, it, it changed my whole understanding. See, this is what we're talking about, justification. And the moment that we believed, you know, now that's in the past. And what, what it did, it saved us from the penalty of sin, you know, which is, which is death eternal. You know, we're now declared um, righteous and this is where we can experience freedom from the very power of sin in the present tense as we live our life as we are living and breathing we can be sanctified in the future again we will be glorified those who are justified will be glorified in the future see these two are pretty much, these are, these are a matter of fact. This, however, this is where, again, as you read of the Corinthian church, as we're reading in James, as we're studying through James, you know, again, we're not condoning and we're not promoting uh, a, 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 a sinful, licentious life. Mm, please don't misunderstand that. But we're, what we're saying is we've been set free and, and, and that's why Paul often has to go back and say, you know, so do we sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. You know, do, God forbid, don't even let that thought enter your mind because like, but the reality is 
you know, again, you have been set free, and the fact of the matter is, he has to address it because it's an unfortunate possibility, you know? Because once a person understands the freedom in Christ, you know, again, it's like, whoa. You know, we, we have, been, once, you, once it's settled in your mind that your salvation has absolutely nothing to do with you, but all to do with the uh, sanctifying work and salvation that was provided, you know, as a gift to you on the cross of Christ through his shed blood for the remission of your sin. And once that's settled in your mind, I mean, it, it, is, it is free. And, and the reality is, like, I, it, it, in, the grace of God encourages me to serve him more, you know, because, like, praise the Lord. I, I, I was a slave in my sin, and I've been set free by the gospel of Christ, and now I get to serve my creator without any condemnation. Therefore, there is n- now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Again, none. You know, and again, as, as far as in our walking and when we do sin, because First John, you know, tells us we're going to sin. If you say you're not, you've called God a liar. You know, the reality is we're going to sin. We're going to mess up. We're going to get off course. You know, we're going to fall from grace at some point. And this is why the gospel over and over again by Paul is always reintroduced to the sanctified believer. Remember, 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 remember. It's God, it's God, it's God, it's God. It's not you. Simply get back in fellowship. You know, don't run from it. Don't, don't run from the light. Don't, don't allow the enemy to hold you under his thumb so you become so paralyzed in your fear that you're not glorifying God. That's what we were designed to do. That's a part of our, you know, our divine institution. We were to be image bearers of, of God to all of creation. Not because we were special, but because he made us to be image bearers. And through his image, then, that's what we were to present to the rest of creation. And so that's, you know, again, and that's us, just like Israel was to be a blessing to the world, that's, that's the church. We're to be a blessing, you know, to the world. So this is so significant because, again, all this then is by the grace of God, and it brings glory to God. It does not point. I cannot boast in it. And Jane, or excuse me, Paul goes on to say, or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. So what does he mean? Again, simply, there is only one God. And since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. So he says, then therefore this is there is only one God and he is both he is just and the justifier and Dr. Fruchtenbaum explains uh, it this way he says God has always had only one way of salvation we we uh, determined that earlier as well and that was and is by grace through faith the content of faith has changed over the course of the dispensations. Uh, I really need to go into that more later. I won't have time to do that today, but, but just, just think right now, dispensation, Old Testament, New Testament, just think of it simply like that, okay? The uh, Old Testament, you know, Israel under the law, and again, uh, you know, and then New Testament, uh, you know, um, New Covenant, but, but simply, through the course, uh, over the course of the dispensations, uh, then the content of faith has changed. Yet, regardless of which dispensation one lives in, one is always saved the same way. Therefore, God deals with all people on the same basis. God is one, so he justifies everyone the same way, and that's by, by grace, through faith. Again, and so what he means in, in the content has changed. Again, if you, when you read in Genesis, you do not read of the person Jesus Christ. He has not been revealed yet. The Son hasn't been revealed yet. And even actually all the way up, and if you want to think about it this way, because remember when Peter was pulled, pulled, pulled the Lord aside and rebuked him after he had just made his glorious confession of who he is, and he says, and he rebukes the Lord and says, far be it from you to die, you know. It, this was a temptation for him to not go to the cross. And Satan was speaking through him because remember, he says, get behind me, Satan. You know, again, this was a direct temptation uh, to our Lord Jesus Christ to not go 
to the cross. And so, you know, uh, again, so even all that to say even Peter didn't believe the content of the gospel because Christ hadn't died, been buried, and resurrected yet. So he didn't even, you know, at that point believe the same content that we believe because what we believe, again, as Paul, you know, clearly explains in 1 Corinthians 15 what the content of the gospel is, simply, you know, Christ, him crucified, buried, resurrected bodily, and, uh, uh, you know, again, trusting that the blood of Christ uh, remissed our sin. And so, um, so that, you know, through the course of the dispensations, that's what he means, the content has changed. You know, not the, con- not the condition, you know, not the response, but uh, not how we trust the Lord in faith and believe, but rather the information. And that's what we refer to as progressive revelation. And so, uh, and we are almost out of time, but uh, yeah, I'm not going to be able to get through this um, in that short of time. But um, how about this? Uh, I know I'm giving you a lot of homework this week, but uh, if you will read also, uh, I'll let you do this and be good Bereans and good stewards and go home and rightly divide the word of truth. But if you'll read uh, Galatians um, 4, Galatians chapter 4, Specifically, 21 through 518, but feel free. Galatians isn't too big, big so you get the context. Uh, and uh, I'll give you the context here because I've got a minute to do that. You know, again, so Paul is writing to the brethren, the various local assemblies of saints who make up the church of Galatia. And shortly after Paul's departure from Galatia, Judaizers had come into the assemblies as we read earlier, and tried to impose circumcision on the Gentiles as a condition of salvation. See, they weren't arguing. They weren't denying the cross of Christ. They weren't denying that gospel. They were just wanting them to simply be circumcised in the flesh. Just do this, you know, just again, so we don't, so we're not, you know, because if they, if we don't do this and we don't have you circumcised and we're together, well then, you know, we're going to face persecution, you know, again, that, and, that, and that's the whole thing, and, um, but, you know, there's, and keep in mind when you get in 24, when Paul says these things are symbolic, Paul is speaking allegorically, uh, and he's using an, an analogy or likeness to express his idea there, and this was, in the Jewish, this was called midrash, and so this was a you know, again, where they would use an analogy uh, 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 in order to express a principle, okay? He's not saying this is that, uh, you know, interpreted and this is its uh, exact meaning. meaning. Again, he says, you know, which things are symbolic, in other words, allegorical. Um, but, but, again, just a, you know, just a little... Uh, Side note again here, we'll finish up. So what, what is the purpose of the law? Again, and we read that uh, uh, back up uh, earlier, that every mouth, and this was in Romans three nineteen and 20, and this was one purpose, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So one purpose of the law is that it continues to confirm mankind's condemnation before a righteous God, as the law is the knowledge of sin. So, grace. Do we get it? Do we get it? Do we understand the riches of His righteousness that has, been, been, that has been imputed to those of us who have believed the gospel of Christ? We cannot do anything to, de- to deserve it. And we cannot do, again, we did do nothing to deserve it. 
And as Paul says in, in Corinthians, not that we are sufficient in, our, in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency, our sufficiency is from God. It's a gift from God. You see, God's glorious gift of salvation is given to those who would simply believe the good news message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, buried, and in His bodily resurrection. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You so much. Thank You so much for Your goodness. Thank You so much for the gospel message. Thank You for the book of Romans, Lord, and, and, and all these things, Lord, that You have written so that we might know, Lord. So we didn't witness the miracles firsthand, but Your Word even says, blessed are those who have not seen and believed. So Lord, we, we trust your word and, and, and Lord, your word has already blessed us simply <laughs> because we've believed in that regard, Lord, and, and we believe the gospel message. And Lord, so we, we thank you again for the work you've done and uh, dare we not, Lord, may we not ever try and touch your glory and the work that you did on the cross and add or uh, even take away anything from it, Lord, but may you be rightly glorified, and uh, Lord, may you be lifted up, and may you be uh, the one who receives all honor and glory and praise uh, for uh, for the work that you did, Lord. And uh, Lord, then that's just the beginning. Our salvation is just simply the new birth, and uh, as we are our babes, then... Uh, Lord, may we grow in our sanctification, Lord, because uh, that's your will for our life is our sanctification so that we would be a blessing uh, to the world, Lord, that we would share and give an account for the glorious hope that lies within us that is in uh, the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ. And may we simply preach Christ and Him crucified, Lord. May we not make it about us, but Lord, may we make it about you. And uh, Lord, in our going, in our individual ministries, Lord, uh, whether it's a, a husband or wife or a grandparent or uh, Lord, uh, just a, a young adult or a t wherever our walk is right now, wherever we're at, Lord, uh, may we seek to glorify you there um, as, we, uh, as we learn, Lord, to continue um, uh, to hear your word and grow in faith. And so we thank you and thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.